Hey everyone and welcome to another edition of Seriously Risky Business, the podcast I do with my colleague Tom Uren, which is all about cybersecurity as it relates to government policy, intelligence, things like that. Uh, this work that Tom does with us is supported by the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and also by the wonderful people at Lawfare Media. Uh, we also have a sponsor this week, which is Grey Noise, uh, which does, uh, they operate an internet wide set of sensors that can detect things like automated scanning. They produce, you know, an absolutely amazing amount of intelligence on automated scanning over the internet that can be used for seam enrichment. It can be used by telcos to track abuse related stuff it's uh you know it's it's a well-loved platform let's just put it that way and you can find them at graynoise.io uh tom joins me now g'day mate how's it going g'day patrick how are you good good so we've just been over your newsletter for the week which of course is published at news.risky.biz and also uh on the lawflare lawflare on the lawfare uh blog and um you've written about a couple of things in depth today the first thing we're going to talk about is you know, Adam Boileau and I frequently say on the, you know, the weekly Risky Business main show that states these days sort of behave like hackers going to war with each other in IRC back in the 90s. And, you know, we've got a great example of that sort of behavior here, which is uh, Google's threat analysis group have discovered that Russian APTs are using exploits that were developed by commercial spyware vendors vendors like NSO. Looks like they're a little bit late to the party because they are getting, um, you know, they're getting these exploits kind of after they've been patched. Um, but nonetheless, no one quite knows how they're getting them, right? So why, why don't you walk us through this one? Yeah, yeah. So the story is, uh, it was a watering hole attack and it appears to be aimed at the Mongolian government. And they used a couple of end days at the time that were originally deployed by commercial spyware vendors, Intellexa and NSO Group. And it was standard government cyber espionage, you know, stealing access tokens, that kind of thing. But what caught my attention about this was just the, I guess there was a mystery about how they got a hand on these exploits and the researcher who wrote it up, Clement Le Signe, he's French, um, so I probably totally butchered his you name. You just murdered his name. They're yeah. dispatching the, the French ninjas now to get you. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he didn't think they were reverse engineered. There were too many very fine similarities, so it looked like they'd gotten a hold on the original exploit. He speculated that, you know, they could have bought or stolen them. Now, NSO Group said, denied it had been stolen, I mean, denied it had been sold. It does not sell to Russia. Um, and why buy when you can steal? Um, so there's actually mm. this very, very long history of both hackers and now states stealing exploits. So the the, the states that the state that has been caught doing it recently is North Korea, who's been targeting security researchers who are doing vulnerability vulnerability research. <laughs> I always have trouble with that word. I've, I've chosen the wrong profession. Um, and so, like, and that just totally makes sense, right? So yeah. why wouldn't you do it? And the, the North Koreans, they're using ODA to get more ODA. So yes. using access to get more access. Um, and I guess if you've got access that works against a person, a particular person, why don't you try and find access that works elsewhere? And yeah. so that is somehow my guess as to what would happen. Not certain, but that's my guess. And there's also a whole lot of examples of states really diving in deep into other other malware, other groups, how they operate. So in the piece, I talk about how um, the Russians, they've uh, gone deep on North Korean malware so that they could pretend to be North Korea. So they tried to tried to disrupt the 2018 Winter Olympics. They created this malware and they gave it this veneer of North Korean techniques to try and throw people off. Didn't work now, very didn't... well, though, it has to be said. Yeah, no, that didn't work very well. But there's a better example where they actually took over Iranian malware. So they understood this it is well the, enough. This is the muddy water stuff, right? <laughs> um, I can't remember the name of the group. I just remember that GCHQ talked about it they gave it an APT name, which I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, and 
they took over the malware. They could con command and control malware that the Iranians had deployed, but they could also put down new malware. So they basically understood it inside and out well enough to, to run an operation with it. And yeah, it seems I, do, like... I do remember there was like, it was years ago, and I don't know if it was Muddy Water or whatever, but I do remember there was like some Iranian crew that there was some sort of hostile takeover where some other service and probably the Russians, who knows, yeah, just took it over and started using it as, as their own. So this sort of, you know, access theft. And again, this is stuff we've seen more in the sort of black hat space previously. You think about these kids who used to run, you know, giant botnets for DDoS and whatever, and they mm. would hack each other and get control over each other's bots and try to consolidate. And, you know, it's just really weird, isn't it, when you see states doing the stuff that was first sort of pioneered by teenagers. Yeah, I think the teenage space is always unconstrained and mm. people do what works and my general impression is that states once upon a time were constrained uh for for mostly self-constrained and then over time they've realized that well actually you know we do this new thing and nothing bad happens and so they've gradually un uh you know removed the reins or loosened the reins and they're more you'd, you'd either call it audacious or practical and i think this is the sort of behavior that you see when uh, states just think, well, yeah, that's a good idea. Why don't we just do that? Yeah. Just moving back to those exploit uh, exploits, though, we don't really know if they did steal them or, I mean, you know, you're thinking NSO group, okay, they don't sell to Russia, but we know that they've previously had some pretty lax controls, so maybe they could have bought these exploits through a front company. I mean, we just, we just don't know. We also yep. know that Russia expended considerable resources to hack into certain inboxes at Microsoft's corporate headquarters yep. where, you know, and that's another place where hackers have, have typically targeted is the inboxes of people who receive bug reports, right? Because that's a yep. great place to, to scoop them out. So, I mean, there's a lot we don't know here, but I guess the point is what we do know is that Russian APT groups are going to the effort of somehow obtaining exploits rather than these ones they're not creating themselves they're obtaining them elsewhere looks like they're a little bit late to the party because they're getting them when they're end day uh, but as you point out in the piece you know if you're doing a watering hole attack you probably don't want to use oday for that anyway because it's going to get snapped so you use a recent end day and you're going to have enough people coming through who aren't patched who you're going to get shells on those on those devices yeah that's right so i did see on twitter uh like a rumor about microsoft's um was it the bug bounty program or it's... No, I think it was uh, their, like their, their actual, you know, security response center accounts. Yeah. I think that was the rumor. Yeah, yeah, so I heard a rumor about that being part of the compromise, but I, I don't think I... I never wrote about it because it was never confirmed in any detail. But that's the sort of thing that would make sense. Like that would yeah. clearly be a target for this sort of thing. Um, uh, if it had happened, that would be plausible. Yeah. Yeah. Do we know what the actual exploits here targeted? Uh, the... The report does say, it went into, into, a, into a lot of depth, it was really a technical report, but I, I can't remember. Yeah, no worries, no it was, worries. Well, it was iPhone and Android, so it was Okay, mobile so it was phones. mobile, right, that's why yeah. I wondered. So they probably didn't scoop yeah. that out of Microsoft's inbox, right? So that's kind of uh, yeah. what, what I was wondering there. But yeah, I mean, we've seen people targeting, you know, exploit developer mailing lists and exploit developers themselves and the inboxes of people who receive bug reports. So it's just, uh, you know, it's kind of kind of warms the heart to know this still, stuff still happens. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, so you reassuring. Know. Yeah, um, in, in an odd way, right? Yeah, yeah. And I suppose the point is it, it goes on and states are very motivated to do it. So it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, 100%. All right, so let's move on to the next thing that you wrote about this week, uh, which is about a counterintelligence program in Iran that is innovative, but you don't want to say innovative because that makes it sound cool. And it's kind of more, I think the word we settled on was diabolical. Yeah. Because what they're essentially doing is they're using fake uh, recruitment websites to encourage people who work in Iran, you know, for the government to go and apply for these jobs. And then they put all of this stuff over these job applications so that anybody who was doing them would realize or would think this is yep. somehow connected to uh, Israeli intelligence services. So, you know, um, that's interesting, right? So the idea is you trick people into applying for a job that they know is is connected to Israel and then you can say to them later, well, we don't trust you anymore um, because you, you tried to apply for this job and now we're going to beat you with a lead pipe. That's basically the, the setup here. 
Yeah, yeah. So what struck me about this is this is just totally the opposite of the way an intel a Western intelligence service or security service would operate. So we would do something like uh, security vetting. Um, you monitor and audit systems inside. You do regular uh, security briefings. There's a very strong security culture. But to uh, a pretty large extent, your private life is your private life. And if you go f apply for a job somewhere else, you know, that's your own business. There's this kind of demarcation. Whereas this is taking an outside in approach. It's like, who are all these people? Let's dangle a carrot in front of them that looks, uh, it, I guess it's a poison chalice perhaps in this case, where it looks like if you express interest where that, that raises concerns about your loyalties. Mm. Um, and so, like you said, I, I, I really, the word that sprung to mind was innovative and I just couldn't put, put it down because it's not about identifying, or at least my feeling was it's not about identifying current security threats that are actively working against us. It's about finding anyone who is slightly suspect and using them as an example um, to to keep everyone else in line. So it's a very, felt like a very coercive thing. Yeah, I mean, we've seen examples of like the FBI, once they understand that someone is attempting to be recruited by a foreign state, they might send some agents in to yeah. play the role of recruiters and they get them that way. But, you know, doing it in such a broad-based way, you would not be able to really charge anyone uh, with this in a you know jurisdiction like Australia or the United States. That said, I do wonder whether something like this might be useful in terms of understanding whose clearances might, you know, should come up for review. Um, could you un could you see Western countries ever doing something like this? Like, you know, basically setting up. And I'm pretty sure. I mean, come on, we must be doing this in in some some of these jurisdictions, right? Setting up basically fake recruitment lures for people who are actively seeking to contact, you know foreign states with classified information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it does seem like a good idea, but the problems that occurred to me seem to be one of scope. Like, um, how do you, and also you're trying to um, basically entrap someone in a way. Mm. And so that seemed to be a problem of the ethics rather than the utility. Um, and I think it may be something that lawyers would put a stop to rather than it not being um, worthwhile doing in the first place. It, and in the case of targeting an individual who's already suspect, I think there's a different chain, uh, a different logic, I guess. Hmm. It's that you're, you're gathering evidence instead of gathering suspicion. Um, yeah. So you, you've got a... I guess the the US legal term would be a probable cause in the first place to do that operation. Whereas in this case, uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, there, I don't, I don't know. Is... I mean, we'd, we'd have to talk to a lawyer about that. But I think if you set up a, you know, a website, or, you know, place job ads around, and then, you know, once you had someone from one of these roles apply, and then moved them towards more of a recruitment conversation, and they bit, I, you know, is that is that entrapment? I don't know. But I mean, you know, you don't need to charge people necessarily. You can pull their clearance and I don't think you need yeah. to worry as much about entrapment concerns there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, the the fact is that other countries are doing it. They're, they're mm -hmm. trying to recruit your people using probably exactly the same types of job ads that you would for an internal purpose. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's like a fishing yeah. test, right? Like, you know, approach some of these people on LinkedIn and see see if they're interested in working for China, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Sorry, you failed the fishing, you failed the, the counter counter espionage fishing test. Um, it's all fantastic. Uh, as I say, people can head to uh, news.risky.biz to read uh, everything Tom's put together on this. But mate, we're going to wrap it up there. Keep it keep it nice and tight today. Uh, great to chat to you. I'll look forward to doing it again next week. Thanks, Patrick. <laughs>